Hey there. So, um, to be shvat sameach to everybody. Okay. Um, Gad, as I wrote to you in the duff, in the source sheets, I want to finish off today um, the previous duff makorot, which which um, speaks about, we want to finish off about the initi initiation of Shmuel as a prophet. How does Shmuel actually become a prophet? And what is the process which he goes through? So therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to share the screen with the... Um, okay, we're going to share the screen. Sorry, and we're going to start off with the following statement. Okay, um, what did we learn last week? We learned last week a statement which is written in the book of Shmuel, and it says the following in line number 55 in front of you. Now Shmuel Mesharetit Hashem Lifneeli, Udvar Hashem Hayayakar. And the word of Hashem was dear. It wasn't a normal occurrence. Bayamimahem. Ein chazon nifratz. The vision, God appearing and God speaking to people, was not something which was a common thing. Okay? A Rashi says there, if you look in Rashi, you'll see in line number 61, Ein chazon nifratz. Let nevoah galye. There was no revelation. There was no concept of revelation. And here, all of a sudden, we have what is called in English a paradigm shift. All of a sudden, something changes. The whole relationship between Hashem and human beings, in actual fact, changes. And what happens now? What happens now is the initial vision, the prayer of Hana, line number 125. Line number 125 in front of you. Okay. Shmuel, the first page, Shmuel, the first page, Shmuel number one, line number 125. Vatidar neder vatomar. And Hana makes a vow and she says, Hashem Tzvakot, the Lord of hosts. Amar Rabbi Lazar, Miyom Shebara Akadosh Baruch Hu et Olamo, from the day Akadosh Baruch Hu created his world, Lo haya Adam Shekraol Akadosh Baruch Hu Tzvakot. There was nobody who called Akadosh Baruch Hu Tzvakot. Ad Shabbat Chana, until Chana came, Ukrato Tzvakot, called him the Lord of Hosts. Amra Chana Lifnei Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Chana says in front of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Ribono Shel Olam, Mikol Tzivei Tzvaot Shebarata Baolamecha, Kashe Beinecha Shetiten Li Ben Echad. Is it so hard for you to give me one son? So therefore, what in actual fact happens here? What in actual fact happens is she gives HaKadosh Baruch Hu a new name. The name of Hashem Tzvakot. What does it mean, the word Tzvakot? Line number 130, Al Tzivotam. Okay? Al Tzivotam. Altivotam. Okay. What do we mean by this? What does it mean? Now, this pasuk takes place in this week's, last week's parsha, at the time of Yitziat Mitzrayim. And we have a new terminology there. Hashem takes out Am Yisrael, Altivotam. Says the, the Natsiv there. The Mishtar Tzava. Like in an army. Everybody has his special position. The law, Mu'uravim. 
and not all mixed up. That's one explanation that Nasiv gives. That means everybody knew his position in where, how and where he's going out. Now the Nitziv gives a different explanation, and it's written in English there, the translation. Okay, clearly there is a fixed objective for man upon earth, which means, okay, what does that mean now? Which means to say that HaKadosh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, says the Natsiv, clearly there is a fixed objective for a man upon earth, which means to say now all of a sudden HaKadosh Baruch Hu has given a man tachlis. He's got an objective in his life. Says the Natsiv, the Mashma'o, kol enosh notzar letachlito. Everybody has got an objective. Bzetziv o. And this is his objective. V'chein Yisrael notzru b'tzura miyuchedet miyumot haolam. Now at the time of Yitziat Mitzrayim, the Jewish people have now got an objective. That's how they're going out to Yitziat Mitzrayim, from Mitzrayim, from Egypt. So therefore, when she calls God Hashem Tzvakot, it means to say that Hashem now is creating an objective for the Jewish people. What happens here? What happens here is something amazing in the eyes of Chana. Chana sees there is a new period in the history of the Jewish people, where all of a sudden HaKadosh Baruch Hu is creating for them a new way of looking at life. From Shvatim, from tribes, they now are going to become a nation. If each, each tribe had his judge before, like in Sefer Shoftim, now all of a sudden things are going to change. And let's look in what Reb Tzodak HaKoyen Milublin said. Tzodak HaKoyen Milublin says the following, V'lachen, ad Chana, until Chana, lo haya adam shekraot svakot, kumo shamru beperik ein omdim, ad Shmuel haya dvar Hashem yakar, ein chazon nifratz, there was no prophecy, no revealed prophecy. Shmuel Shmuel was the first one who creates prophecy that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is now giving objectives to a nation. And therefore Chana calls this name Be'etshit Palela Al Shmuel B'Shem Zeh. And this is what she calls Davens to Hashem at that period. And that's why the end of the book of Shoftim ends the following way. Bayamim hahem ein melech b'Yisrael. There is no king in Israel. Ish hayashar ve'enav ya'aseh. A man can do what he likes. What does that mean? Says the Abra Benel. This is an introduction to the book of Shmuel. They didn't have a king. What changes in the period of Shmuel? What changes in the period of Shmuel is that all of a sudden Hashem changes the relationship between him and Am Yisrael. If before there were no direct connection, there was no direct communication, all of a sudden Hashem realizes that Am Yisrael, so to speak, to say, Hashem, Am Yisrael are in Eretz Yisrael. They have to have a central leadership. They have to have somebody who's going to collect them and bring them all together. And that is the word tzvakot. 
they are now having an objective, not as tribes, but as a nation. And that is what's going to change in the whole relationship between Akadosh Baruch Hu and the Jewish people. And that's what is mentioned, and that's why it is so important, the statement which is written, or how Shoftim ends, Bayamim ahem, ein melech b'Yisrael, ish hayashar b'inav yaseh, and Shmuel begins with the word Hashem Tzvakot. That is what's going to happen now. What's going to happen now is Akadosh Baruch Hu is going to appear directly to Shmuel. And let's read the next Pasuk in line number 150 or some other lines perhaps which is written here. And there was that day. The Eli Shochev Bimomo. And the Eli is lying in his place. The Enav Hechelu Kehot. And his eyes began going down. He was getting blind. Lo Yuchat Lirot. He couldn't see. Now, this statement is an introduction to the next sentence. Just jump over to the next sentence after the Malbim, after the first, sorry, the first section, Vener Elokim Terem Yichbeh. The next sentence speaks about how Hashem appears to Shmuel. Ushmuel Shochev Beichal Hashem, Asher Sham Aron Elokim. So therefore you have two sentences describing the situation. You have Eli, going blind, and Shmuel is lying in the Mishkan. Now, what do we mean by this? Now, Eli is lying in his place, and he's going blind. What does it mean he's going blind? That means Hashem's not appearing to him. In a spiritual way, Hashem is not appearing to him. But it means a deeper concept. And what does that mean? If we look at it, says the Malbim, he bayomahu shebo bayom ish elek eli. A man, a prophet is going to come to Eli and he's going to tell him that your family is going to be destroyed. But the reason why is the following. The following is for Hashem litkof achazon haze el achazon arishon lorot kinachon. Hadavar me'ima elokim. Hashem is changing. He's quickly changing. Ki kol gzeira v'hodash me'mit hanishnet moreshi charutza. Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to do. And what's written? What's happening now? Eli. Eli. Sheyarad az achoranit bein b'malot nafshiot. Eli is going down. In his spiritual capacity. Eli was lying in his place, in his room. Where does Eli? Eli's in his place. But where does Shmuel be sleep? Shmuel Shochev Beichal Hashem. A paradigm shift. Shmuel goes away, and Shmuel begins. Rak shachav bimkomo agashmi mamash, shchiva shel sheina. He's lying down and sleeping. Va'avodat ha-kohen haya lishmo et ha-mikdash. And the job of a kohen is to care about the mishkan, is guard it. Ve'gam ba-layla lo yishkav li bo ba-makom. And even at night, he shouldn't just, just sleep like that. But what should he care about? He should care about the Mishkan, and Shmuel and Eli is going down. And look in, the, in, the, in, in front of you, you'll see in line 165, says the Malbim, the following, Upitom avar alehem achusha, 
Eli all of a sudden begins to go down. Look in the sentence. Ve'enav heichelu keihot. They begin to go down. His physical eyes and his spiritual eyes. Eli's going down. The period of Eli is ending. V'shimsho she'enav heichelu liot keihot miseva v'zikna. U'pitom avar aleim achusha ad shelo yechol el oral gamri. וכפי שירד אלי, בשמשו הייתה קרובה להשתקע אל המערב, in the same way as אלי was going down similar to the sun setting in the west, כן היה מוכרח, כי כאור הבוקר יזרח, שמשו של אלי, של שמואל, יפיץ קדים עלי ארץ. the same time, as the sun is setting, so the sun is rising. Shmueli setting in the west, Shmuel rising in the east. We have a change of leadership, a change of communication, a change of looking at Am Yisrael in a different way. Chana, Davens to Hashem and she says, you are now becoming the Lord of the people who are going to have a tachlit. They're not going to be just little tribes living, running around in Israel. But now they're going to become a nation. And my son Shmuel is the one who's going to forge ahead and create this leadership. And what does it say? It says the following. V'ner Elokim terem yichbeh. And the candle of Hashem hasn't extinguished completely. That means Hashem never, never extinguishes his light. Even when Eli can't see it, it exists. But Shmuel, where is he? Who? Shochev Beichal. He is lying in the Heichal. Hashem, Asher Shameron Elokim. Says the Malbim, v'inei matzas az et Shmuel. Hashem finds Shmuel muchan el sheitgalei alav or agadol azeh. Im mitzad azman shaya besof alayla, shaya dolek me'erev ad boker, or because he has a clean brain, he has a clean head, he's beginning to create new ideas. And that's what it means in this sentence, at the same time, when Eli goes down, Shmuel comes up. Now, what happens now? We're going to jump over to the end of the chapter. And if you see, we're now going to jump over the prophecy which Hashem tells Shmuel, because that is dependent on the next story of the sins of the sons of Eli. But what happens? After the prophecy, Vaigdal Shmuel. Shmuel grows up. Vashem haya imo. And Hashem is with him in everything. Lohipil mikol dvarav arza. Shmuel never, ne never let go anything which Hashem said to him. Vayeda kol Yisrael midan ve'ad be'er sheva. Please take note of this statement. All the people of Israel knew. That's what we said, Hashem tzvakot. A new paradigm, a new period in the history. All Am Yisrael know. From where? From Dan Ad Be'er Sheva. From north to the south. Because all of a sudden, you have Ne'eman Shmuel Le'Navi Lashem. Because Shmuel was the most faithful prophet to Hashem. Not from the period of Yoshua have we had somebody who is so faithful to Hashem. By Yosef, Hashem. But on the other hand, Hashem continues to appear in Shiloh. Ki nigla Hashem el Shmuel b'Shiloh b'dvar Hashem. The focus of the relationship between Hashem and Shmuel carries on in Shiloh, even though Shmuel will go from place to place. Now, 
What are we going to do? How are we going to understand this statement of Shmuel? Now let's learn the Rambam. The Rambam says the following. The Rambam says, Kol Navi, sheyamod lanu, any prophet who will stand for us, the Yomar, sheyashem shlacho, and it says that Hashem has sent him, ain't no tarech lasot ot keechad metot Moshe Rabbeinu o kotot Eliyahu veElisha, sheyesh behem shinui min agosh el haolam. A prophet does not need to make any miracles like Moshe or Eliyahu or Elisha. Ela ot shelo, but the sign is, sheyomar dvarim ha'atidim. He's going to say things which are going to take place in the future. Liot ba'olam. And everybody's going to believe about in his words. Therefore, when somebody will come who's befitting for prophecy, he's not going to change the Torah. We don't say to him, split the sea or revive somebody. If you are a true prophet, tell us things which are going to take place. And he says, And we are waiting. We check him out plenty of times. Let's take, who does the Rambam take an example of the prophet who every single thing which Shmuel says, which every single thing which the prophet said took place, the Rambam says, Shmuel. Shmuel is the example of a prophet. You check him out. All the Jewish people from Israel knew. They all questioned him. They all asked him what's going to happen. And he told them. And it happened. And that is the explanation which happens as far as Shmuel is concerned. Shmuel is the greatest prophet who exists from the period of Moshe until, Yosh, until Shmuel until, and Yoshua until Shmuel. Nobody was like him. And that's what we spoke about, the change in the whole relationship between Akadosh Baruch Hu and Am Yisrael. This is a new period. And when we say in Pirkei Avot, what do we say in Pirkei Avot? We say in Pirkei Avot, Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai, Misara Yoshua, Yoshua Zkeinim, Uzkeinim Lanviim, the first prophet. Who is called a prophet is Shmuel. Nobody has been related, nobody has been called, even though we know there's Dvoran and Via, nobody was mentioned about him. Nobody. Now, that is the story of Shmuel, the initial stages of Shmuel. Now, what happens meanwhile? Why does Eli fail? What happens with Eli now? Why doesn't Eli manage to continue his, what's it called, his, his legacy? He's a Kohen. Just remember what we learned about him. He's a Kohen, Hagadol. He's the head of the Sanhedrin. He's like a Melech. 
is everything. Well, what happens to him? And now we're going to start off the next page. The next page speaks about the sins of the sons of Eli. And on this, we're going to have at least two shiurim. Because the paradigm shift which takes place is not just an accident. Or it's not just HaKadosh Baruch Hu changing his attitude. It is people who change. People, Rabotai, change. Therefore, we cause, in a way, HaKadosh Baruch Hu to change. Not changing. Let me explain to you in a different way. There's a fascinating explanation of the Rambam in his Guide to the Perplexed. When we speak about Hashkacha, divine providence, so to speak, we try to explain in that that is the Rambam's explanation, why tefillah helps. And the Rambam there explains the following idea. And I know it's going to be a bit complicated for me to explain, but I'm going to try to explain it in my own words. So to speak, HaKadosh Baruch has different levels of Hashkacha, different levels of divine providence. We're not speaking about extreme cases because i know phil's going to ask me the holocaust i'm not going to explain the holocaust finished okay i'm not going to explain it but as far as the concepts of divine providence everybody changes and goes into levels different levels of divine providence the highest period level of divine providence is when shlomo amelch built the mishkat and the base amikdosh Fire came down from heaven. The whole of the country was in ecstasy, spiritual ecstasy. Shmuel, the period which we're speaking about, is what? Is a period where Ein Melech Israel. Please take note, the word Ein Melech Israel doesn't only mean there isn't a king in Israel. They don't recognize HaKadosh Baruch as a king. It's Two ways round. It's there's no physical king and there's no spiritual king. And all of a sudden you have this great Chana, who El Elkanah, husband, as we learned right at the beginning, creates a new movement of going to Shiloh and trying to change the whole perspective of the Jewish people. And that's what happens. There's a new perspective. But on the other hand, why is this necessary? Because on the other hand, there is a downfall. There is a downfall of leadership of the sons of Eli. The legacy of Eli is setting in the West. And therefore, the level of divine providence is low. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is preparing the next level of divine providence. Where Shmuel is going to uplift the people. We are not talking about... A period where there's sunrise, sunset, and sunrise. And it's exactly at this period where Hashem looks, so to speak, at the leaders. And who are the leaders while Shmuel is sitting in the Mishkan? And who's sitting there? Let's look at the next page. Page number the son, Chet Bnei Eli. Chet Bnei Eli. Now, I've given you the English translation of this because the words are a bit hard. And in front of you, we're going to start reading in line number five. Ubnei Eli, Bnei Bliyal. They are, in the English translation, they are scoundrels. Now, we're not going to take this exactly literally, but lo yad'u et Hashem. Now, the translation is they paid no heed to the Lord. It doesn't mean they didn't pay any heed. Okay, it doesn't mean to say they worshipped idols. Lo yad'u. The word ladat, rabotai, does not mean they didn't pay heed. There wasn't communication between them and Hashem. Please take note, the first time the word Ladat is mentioned in the Torah, 
is not knowledge of Hashem. It's written, Vayeda Adam et Chava Ishto. There was communication. There was physical communication. There were physical relationships. And that is the word Yidia, a fusion. What is knowledge? Knowledge is the ability to man for man to see and read, and he creates and he fuses with what he sees into his brain. That is knowledge. Bnei Eli did not have a fusion with Akadosh Baruch Hu. They didn't have a connection. They didn't communicate. They didn't have the ability to uplift the people. Now, why was that? What happened? And that's why I don't like the translation. Translation doesn't mean they didn't pay heed. They just didn't have it. They weren't able to lead the people because they couldn't uplift them. They didn't have this fusion with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And how does this take place? And it's written, Umishpat HaKohanim et Ha'am Kol ish zoveach zevach Uba nara kohen kvashel basar Vahamazleg shalosh ashinayim biyado this is how the priest used to deal with the people. That means the children of Eli, the sons of Eli, used to deal with the people. What did they used to do? People used to bring sacrifices. When anyone brought a sacrifice, the, the priest's boy would come along with a three-pronged fork while the meat was boiling. Now, we all know that, and the continuation of it is the following, the ka. Bakiyor or Badud, line number 10. Vaya Bakikar, Ika Bakiyor or Badud or Bakalachat or Parol. Kola She Yalea Mazleg, Ikaha Kohen, Bokaha Yasul, Kolisa Elabaim Shambashilo. And he would thrust into the cauldron or the kettle or the big pot or the small pot or whatever the fork brought up. The priest would take it away. This was the practice at Shiloh with all the Israelites who came there. So what do they used to do? They, Lichora, if anybody knows the Psukim, they, the Kohanim, from every Korban, used to get a certain portion. Okay, it's called Chazev Shok. Certain portion. What did these guys used to do? They used to take anything. Whatever was now that person brought a Korban Shlamim, he was allowed to eat from it. What did the Kohanim used to do? They used to make sure that wherever the Jews were cooking from the Korban Shlamim, they'd get this massive three-pronged fork and schlep out a whole big piece of meat far beyond what was supposed to be given to them. What else did they do? Pasuk Tetvap. Gambeterem yaktirun Even before offering up the chelev, the facts, okay, because we all know that there's the first Mishnah in Basechet Brachot, which says that there's this thing which is called, you offer up on the Mizbeach, haktarat chalavin ve'emurim. You offer up the fat part of the animal, you offer up the inside, you put that on the Mizbeach. That the Kohen wasn't allowed to take food before they offered up the chelev. No, gambeterem. Hand over some meat to roast from the, for the priest. For he won't accept. Okay. He doesn't want cooked meat. He only wants live meat, fresh meat. And what was the answer of the people? And the man would say to him, let them first turn the suet into smoke. Let them first offer up the chelev and then take how much you want. First of all, you do your job. You offer up the chelev. What are you taking from me, the meat, before I've cooked it? And he would reply, no, hand it over at once or I'll take it by force. And then says, the Navi sends, but he 
חטאת הנערים גדולה מאוד את פני השם. The sin of the sons of Eli was very great in the eyes of Hashem. Why? כי ניאצו האנשים את מנחת השם, because the men treated the Lord's, the Lord's offering in a very, very bad way. Rabbi Isai, what would you call in modern day language? The Kohanim had a mafia. They had a mafia. They did not relate to the people's sacrifices in a correct way. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to see some of the Mephoshim on this. And we're going to see how they understood the concept of a priest, first of all. What is the concept of a Kohen? Says the Abra Banel, a fascinating insight. ובני אלי בני בליאל. יתחיל הכתוב לספר שבני אלי הכהן היו בני בליאל במידות ובדעות. They were bad people in their מידות, in their attributes, and the connection with השם. ויהיה פירוש בני בליאל, לא להגיד שהיו בני אלי שהיה בליאל. That means they weren't just סתם. כי אם להגיד עוונותיהם, שאם היותם בני אלי כהן ושופט, כמלאך השם צבקות. In the eyes of a people, a כהן is supposed to be like a מלאך, like an angel. A כהן is supposed to represent הקדוש ברוך הוא in this world. הנהם היו במידותיהם, they in their attributes, were people who were rotten, despicable. V'hine haya siba b'ze, l'fi shelo yadu et Hashem. They didn't realize what Hashem wants from a Kohen. They don't realize what Hashem wants from a Kohen, how to relate to the people. When people come to bring a Korban to Hashem, they want to communicate with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the Kohen is supposed to uplift them spiritually. He doesn't behave like a Chaza. He doesn't behave like somebody who takes whatever he wants. He's supposed to uplift them. He's supposed to be an anav, a humble person. And they behave exactly the opposite way. And because they didn't understand what Hashem wants from them, and because they didn't have proper faith, אשר בהם היו רשעים במעשיהם, וכדברי דוד המלך, אמר נבל בליבו, A rotten person will say in his heart, אין אלוקים, ובעבור זה הם because of this, השחיתו את איבו עלילה אין עושה טוב. That's what happens. So therefore they have two things. They don't recognize הקדוש ברוך הוא, but it's even more than that. They have a tiver for meat. They're crazy over food. They love their meat. And the Ralbag explains what does it mean to be crazy over food. We know that there is some person in the Torah who HaKadosh Baruch Hu punishes when he's young. He's called Ben Sorer Umore. And what's the word which is used? Zolel. He chaps as much food as he can. He takes... He takes from this and he takes from that, everything he takes. So therefore, the tava, the desires, okay, is so great that eventually they overcomes their connection with the three between them and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now let's look at the language of the Torah when the Torah speaks about a Kohen. And here we're going to see Exactly the opposite. Two words which are so important. When the Torah speaks about a Kohen, it says the following. Lo ye la Kohen vla levim kol shevet levi chelik v'nachala am Yisrael. Ishei Hashem v'nachala to lo chelun. They eat from what Hashem gives them. V'nachala to lo ye lo b'kerev achiv. Hashem u'nachala to. 
God is their inheritance. What does that mean? That means they are the ones who communicate with Hashem. That is the objective of a Kohen. And how do they have to they behave? How do the people relate? The Israel gives to the Kohen. You give to him. The Israel gives to the Kohen. The Kohen receives from the Israel. Let's take the next place. I give you. It's always giving. Hashem gives to the Kohen. The Israel gives to the Kohen. The whole time there's a giving. And let's read next stage. I give to God. God gives to the Kohen. That is the way it works. My objective of the Israel is the Israel gives to Hashem. And that's why, according to one opinion, they are the messengers of God. So therefore, how does it work? The Jew gives to God. God gives to the Kohen. And carries on and on the whole time. The word which is mentioned in line number 80 called Chumot HaKodoshim HaSheyarum Israel, Natati Lecha, I gave you. There's always the giving. Hashem gives and the Ko Israel gives. Now let's go back to the story of the sons of Eli. And let's take note how many times there's the word which is opposite. Line number 10. Pasuk Yud Daled. Okay. Vika bakiyor bagdud o bakalachat o paparur. And he'll bang on the pot, etc., etc. Kol asher yale amazleg. What's the word? Yikach ha kohen. The kohen takes. He's not given. He takes. Next sentence. Gambeterem yaktirun et achelev. Uvan nara kohen va amal isha zoveach. Tnali, give me. Lo yikach mimcha basa. He's not going to take ordinary meat. Vayomere lav kate yaktirun ke yovachelev. Vekach lecha. Take him. Vim lo, line number 15. Lakachti bechozka. As if the kohen owns the meat. I own everything. I take. Just look at the opposing words. The Torah always emphasizes the word Netina and Shmuel, the sons of Eli, talk about taking. Who owns? Does the Jew give to Hashem and Hashem gives to the Kohen, or does the Kohen take? Rabotai, this is the beginning of the paradigm shift. When Akadosh Baruch Hu sees the behavior of Kohanim like that, then something has to change. This is not the Jewish people who I want. These aren't the leaders who I want. That is the first introduction to the sons of Eli. Now let's go stage further. Line number 80. Veli hakohen. Veli pasuk chafbet. Ve'eli zaken mo'od. Ve'shama et kol asher ya'asun banav l'chol Yisrael. And he hears how his, behave, his sons are behaving towards the Jewish people. And now comes a new statement. Ve'et asher 
ישכבון את הנשים הצובות בעת החול מועד. And all of a sudden, they're beginning to lie with women. Okay, the translation here is, and how they lay with the women who performed the tasks of the, of the tent of the meeting. Now, this is a very strange statement. What do you mean? They're raping them. They're raping women. Now, I'm going to give you a short introduction to one of the most important ideas which are mentioned in the Tanakh. And in the Torah. And this is the following. The Torah and the Nevi'im are perceptions of God to human beings. Perceptions of God. Okay. Our rabbis often change the perceptions. And they claim that what? That sometimes things aren't so bad let me give you an example the first example which i'm going to give you is the golden calf the story of egel as i have the way it's portrayed in parsha kitsa is in actual fact all am israel worship idol worship all of them hashem afterwards goes after all of them and moshe rabbeinu prays for them and then finally they find out who how many people worship it but in the first perception, Shichet Amcha, your people have been, have gone bad. And Hashem says to Moshe, I'm going to wipe out all this nation. And Moshe has to pray. That means in the absolute perception of God, Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelazeh, all Jews are responsible, you're a, lo a load of no gooders. You're not good. All of a sudden, the Kuzari and the Ramban say, listen, it wasn't exactly idol worship, etc., etc., etc. In the eyes of God, in the eyes of the absolute, any mistake is a miss as good as a mile. Remember that, Rabotai. A miss is as good as a mile. You're aiming the dart in the middle of the dartboard. You didn't get the center one. You've lost. You missed it. Okay, you're throwing the ball in basketball. It didn't go in the net. You missed it. Finished. Okay. That means in the perception of Akurush Borhu, any mistake, you've missed. You're finished. Now, and therefore, the language which Hashem uses is a language of severity. A language whereby we have to realize that in God's eyes, we've missed it, guys. We have missed it. Now, the same thing with Eli. Eli's children misbehave. In the eyes of Akurush Baruch Hu, this misbehavior also relates to what? To their relationship to women, which we'll explain in a minute, which Chazal will explain in a minute. It doesn't mean to say they raped them, Chasal Khalida. Wasn't that bad. But they did do things which, in actual fact, causes Akadosh Baruch Hu to change his whole plan. That's one thing. And you see that throughout the Tanakh. You see the sin of David Amelech. Etc., etc., in the eyes of Akadosh Baruch Hu, it's the most terrible thing. Chazal say, hey, listen, we fiddle around with it in the Psukim. But that is the perception of Akadosh Baruch Hu to man's actions. If it's not perfect, it's nothing. It's Ephes, Zil. Okay? There's no such thing as half lies. There's either truth or false. And in the world of Akadosh Baruch Hu, Something which is 100% is false. Now let's go back to the statement after this introduction. Okay. What does it say here? And then we're going to, I'm going to let you ask as many questions as you want because this is a complicated business. What does it say here? It says the following. Bana, <laughs> 
למה תעשון כדברים האלה? Why are you doing such bad things? אשר אני שומע את דבריכם, ראים את כל העם. אל בניי, פליז מי צ'ולדרן, לא טובה השמועה. The things which I'm hearing is no good. אשר אני שומע. מעבירים עם השם. You're making things bad between הקדוש ברוך הוא and you. Now the next sentence is very complicated. which I prefer to leave till next shiur, which we'll go into in great detail, the next sentence. But what I want to speak about is the statement of Yishkavun et Anashim. Now says the Brabanel, Ve'liza ken mo'od m'shama, Hinei odia katuv shaya Elia zaken mo'od, zaken mo'od, K'day hit la'atet hit na'atzlut v'tana m'aspeket ba'adot. Lama lo ayam yaseret banav? Why he didn't rebuke his children? Ve'ech lo yikab b'shotim? Why didn't he deal with them properly? Ve'lama lo dibel em divrei rivot? And didn't argue with them? And send them away? Achrei yotam mechalim et kunat Hashem after they profaned God's ways. Ve'amar she'az haken ma'od. U'mukhuleshet kochotav. He was very weak. וגבורת הבנים לא היה יכול להם, and he couldn't stand up against his children. So therefore, Eli is dying down. He doesn't have the ability to rebuke his children properly. Now let's go to the next stage. באשר ישכבון, and now the Abra Benel says the following statement. באשר ישכבון את הנשים הטובות פתח על מועד. רוצה לומר המתפללות, they daven. כמו שתרגם יונתם, דעתי לצלה, the women came to Davan. ומאשר הנביא אשר בא אל אלי, לא הכריחו כלל על זה עניין, later on we'll see that השם, the נביא never rebuked them for raping. But what does it say? מצאו מקום לחזור לפרשו שלא כמשמעו. ואמר במסכת שבת, מה אני מקיים אשר ישכיבו את הנשים הצובות? משום ששהו את קניהם. ולא הלכו אצל בעליהם, מלא עליו הכתוב כאילו שכבון. We all know a woman who has a child, a yoledet, has to bring a korban, sacrifice. Okay, it's called korban yoledet. A woman who has problems, she's called a zava, sometimes she also has to bring a korban. And in this situation, the women all queued up outside the Mishkan to bring their korbanot. Now, what do they bring? They bring a little chicken. They have to bring a couple of doves. So therefore, what do these guys do? These guys put them end of the queue. They make them wait. Why? Because we want the good meat, guys. We want the good. We want the steaks. We want the, the what's it called? The fat meat, etc., etc. We don't want chickens. We won't get anything out of the chickens. They just get burnt on the altar. So what are we going to gain from it? So therefore, what do they do? They make the women wait. Making the women wait often meant they came from far. They didn't go back to their husbands. And therefore, Hashem looked at it as if they're stopping these women from being with their husbands. So, so to speak, the sons of Eli take over. They control these women. It doesn't mean literally they slept with them, but it means they control them. And says the following, says the Abra Benel, V'yeim ken perusha katub al pidar kam, sh'anashim hayoldot. והזבות, היו באות לשילו בקורבנותיהם, כפי שחייבתה מהתורה. והם היו עצובות פתח על מועד, לפי שהיו נוספות שם בצבא. והדלת הבית נקרא צבא. And they also wait outside. ובני אלי היו מתעצלים בהקרבת קורבנותיהם. They were lazy in offering up their sacrifices. באופן שלא יוכלו ללכת לבתיהם וישכבו שם, they used to have to sleep there sometimes, in שילו outside. ולזה אמר שישכבון את האנשים, רוצה לומר שהם היו הסיבה שישכבו שמה ולא ילכו לבתיהם, הנשים הצובות. 
Chazal say, what does that mean? It means to say, Rabotai, that the children of Eli were breaking up families. They used to make the women wait and the husbands were left at home with the children and there was all pressure in the families and Eli, sons of Eli could not care how this would be. And that, Rabotai, is the story of the sons of Eli. From bad to worse. They wanted their meat. They wanted their steaks. They wanted the fat meat. They couldn't care less about women. Having to sleep outside the Mishkan, etc., etc., etc. And Eli rebukes them. But it doesn't help. And now we come to the final sentence which is perhaps the most important one. And it's a very complicated sentence because it says the following. He says to them, in line number 87, <laughs> Now we'll read the English translation and we will go into it a bit deeper. If a man sins against a man, the Lord can pardon him. But if he, a man, offends God, who can obtain pardon from him? And he says, listen, guys, you are Shlichei Hashem. You are messengers of God. You're not messengers of Am Yisrael. You are my shlichim on this world. So if you just sin between man and man, then Hashem could pardon you. But what are you doing? You're causing the greatest chilul Hashem in the world. You are taking all the meat. You're taking before the chilev is offered up. You're making women sleep outside. You're making women last in the queue. This is a Chilul Hashem. And the minute it's a Chilul Hashem, Hashem doesn't pardon Chilul Hashem ever. If one looks at the Rambam in the beginning of Ilchot Shuva, the Rambam says that if a person transgressed a mitzvah to say, he gets one tshuva, then there's another tshuva, lot aseh. Tshuva does not exist when there is Chilul Hashem. Never. And what you are doing is the greatest Chilul Hashem possible. Because your objective is to Mekadesh Shem Shamai. And what are you doing? You're exactly doing the opposite. And there's no Tshuva, Eli says, to what? To people who are doing Hashem. And what are his children? How do his children react? The law Yishma'u Lekol Avihem. And they didn't, line number 90, they didn't listen. Now comes the phrase, Ki Chafetz Hashem Lahamitam. Which means to say the following, in a historical perspective, Historical. This statement, the narrator is saying it. The narrator of the book, the author of the book, is telling the story. And he says, it works two ways, Rabotai. There is the plan of God and there is the plan of man. They don't do tshuva, but they're not aware why they aren't doing tshuva. They're not doing tshuva because they're enjoying themselves. They're having a great time. They're using people. They are using their food. They're using their women. Everything they are using. But in a historical perspective, there's something greater in it. Hashem wants this period to be finished. Hashem wants to create a new period. And that 
is the beginning of the downfall of this period where Shmuel takes over. So there are two things taking place. Hashem uplifting Shmuel. Hashem wants to change the whole system. And that's what's happening now. And that's what we call, what we call it Kufat Ma'avar. It's a period of changes. The period of changes are the most important. That's it, Rabotai. Questions? Anybody? Yeah. Please. No questions. Hmm? No, they, don't, they can also speak if they want. I'm muted. Okay, anybody wants can speak. It's okay. No. Uh, why did you take uh, the more charitable interpretation of the behavior of the sons? Because I'll explain to you why. Because we don't find later on that Hashem um, that Hashem punishes them for that. Well, okay. That means in a later, we will see next time we learn, there'll be a prophet who'll come and explain, and Hashem will come to explain to Shemuel why he's changing. We don't find that Hashem is punishing them for that thing, for the, the story with the women. That's why Chazal feel that there's something else behind the scenes here. Okay? Now, if you look at the sentence, I'll give you an example. Okay? Mm -hmm. What's written there, what's written there is the following. Um, it's written... Um, it's written, Vet asher yishkavun hanashim. Yeah. Okay? Yishkavu, they lie down. They don't, if it would have been, if it would have been that they caused it, it should have been Yashkivun in the Hifil. They forced them to lie down. No, the women used to lie down. That means they made them lie there. That's what it means. It doesn't mean they lied with them. Because then it would have been Yashkivun. I forced a woman to lie down. Here it's Yishkavun. The women had to lie down there. So that's why Chazal understand that it's not, in actual fact, a, um, um, a, a literally the literal word of rape. It's a hifil. It would have been the hifil if it would have been rape. This yeah, is the cow. It, it caused them to lie down because they were hanging because, out. Nahon. Okay, but that's the way Chazal see it. Interesting. You got them off the rape yeah. charge. Yeah. Any other questions? One more question. I, I would, yes. You'd miss it if I didn't mention the Holocaust. Uh, given what's going on now, how can you ignore the significance of that and put it to one side when it's the most phenomenal evil thing that we have seen in our lifetime? I don't put it to a side. I've got no answer for it. I can't put what it in any, in any... That's what I mean. I can't take any of the stages of Hashkacha, of divine providence. That's what I mean. Okay. I don't, I, I can't put it in any box. You understand? No. In the concept of Hashkacha, the way I explain it, everybody goes up and down in different standards of Hashkacha, of divine providence. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the Shoah, I can't put it in any box of Hashkacha. That means Hashem, so to speak, did Astarat Panim. He hid himself. He what? He hid himself. How to understand that, I don't. Okay, I don't. I don't know. I live with questions. Does. We live with questions. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Any other questions? Okay, Rabotai. Uh, Thank you very much. Shalom. Look up. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay, then. Keep well, guys. Look after yourselves. Bye. Shabbat shalom.